Good afternoon. Today is uh, another sermon in the in the series on what we believe, and I just love that last song because really that has walked us right through all of the essentials of the faith. You probably recognize them in there. Those are the last few sermons that I've done. We're right there in that song. It's kind of a summary song for the whole the whole. Uh, sermon series on the essentials, partly because it's from the Apostles' Creed, and uh, that's, the, uh, that's the, the basis for that. But I hope you've begun to see why it's so important to know what it is we believe and why we believe in the applications of that, and I hope when you communicate that you can communicate what it is we believe with confidence, that you can say, wow, this, this is indeed what we believe, because our proclamation is important. What we as a church proclaim is important. It's important not only that we know it, but that we actually proclaim it. And look where we've been. We believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible, authoritative Word of God. We believe that there is one God who eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in His virginal conception, in His sinless life, in His miracles, in His vicarious and atoning death. Through his shed blood, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and in his personal return in power and glory. That's what we believe. We believe that for the salvation of the lost and sinful man, regeneration by the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit, by whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a godly life. We believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost, those that are saved into a resurrection of life and those that are lost into a resurrection of damnation. And and we call these beliefs essential because they are essential to a biblical understanding of what evangelical Christianity is. They're closed fist because when you depart from one of them or many of them, the Christianity that you proclaim departs from biblical Christianity and begins to be cultish. Cultish. Because to depart from them is to shipwreck your faith on the shoals of heresy. My my theology teacher used to say that the, the river of theology is deep in the middle, but on the edges, look out. Because there's rocks and there's shallows, and you can find in the history of the church ships that were wrecked. Departing from these essentials takes your beliefs and then by application your life of worship in directions that are self-destructive and dangerous. And if a church is not in agreement with these, the essence of these essentials, then we can't fully stand with them as as, as brothers in Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today. The last one of these we believe statements. We believe in the spiritual unity of believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the spiritual unity of believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the last one of the essentials. I said they're closed fists because they're non-negotiable. Now, we're not going to be all done with this sermon series because I'm going to talk about some that that we hold with an open hand, right? But the ones that are closed hand, those are the ones today that we're going to finish with. And the last one is this. We believe in the spiritual unity of believers and the Lord in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus as he prays for us. In John 17, 20 through 23, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The church, believers, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal to the rest of the world, the fallen world, through us. And Jesus makes it really clear that when the church is living in unity, then the world will know and understand who God is, who Christ is, and the love of the gospel. They'll understand. When the church is in unity, that's why these essentials are so essential. 
Because if, if the church isn't in unity on these things, then what happens is there's schisms and divisions and breakdowns and fights. And thankfully not right now, but there even were wars and, and, and killings in the history of the church between churches that had different views on these things. And when the world sees division, when the world sees confusion and chaos, then the gospel of Jesus Christ is confused. These beliefs are, are a boundary, a border, if you will. The bo in the border, they define biblical Christianity. And within these borders, we're unified. We believe in the spiritual unity of believers in Jesus Christ. I can't be unified with people outside of these borders. If you believe the Bible is devotional material from the early church and does not have authority... Doesn't, that we don't have to do it, that it's optional. And I, I can't be unified with you. If you do not believe in the Trinity, one God whose Scripture reveals is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I, I can't be in unity with you. I can't say, hey, hey, brother, I know there's lots of gods in heaven. That's not what Scripture teaches. I can't be in unity with you. If you believe that no one will experience judgment and damnation by God, but that everyone goes to heaven... If you're just good enough or sincere enough, all dogs go to heaven, right? I, I can't be in unity with you because that's not what Scripture teaches. It just doesn't say that. See, because our message is confused and one of us has gotten away from the reality of what Scripture reveals, but if in these things we are in agreement, then our unity can be complete. And there's some incredible blessings that come out of this unity. The first one is that we will find ourselves in the will of God. When we're unified in this way as Christians, we'll find ourselves in the will of God. Look at John 17 again, 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We'll be right where God wants us. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all the people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. That's what he wants. God wants all people to be saved and people will know that Jesus is the real deal when the church is unified. I don't know about you, but I love being right in the middle of doing what God wants me to do. I love being in the place where he wants me to be doing the things he wants me to do. I love pleasing God. Doesn't that feel good to please God? Yeah, you know what? I just did this, and it, it pleases God. That makes me happy. It should make us happy. Not boastful or proud, or we don't go around getting stickers or something like that, but, but, but it should make us happy. And I don't like displeasing God. And when we understand that it's God's will that we're unified, that is those who are in agreement on these essentials that we're unified, that we're pleasing God. It's a simple point. I'm going to leave it simple. It, it's God's will that we're unified. And when we're unified, we're pleasing God. And when we're in disunity, we're not pleasing God. That's not what he had in mind. Pretty simple. There's a second blessing. When we're unified, we produce the results, the fruit that God has in mind for his church. You're very familiar with the competitive model and how businesses operate, right? Because that's the world we live in. You go buy your groceries at Albertsons, but not at Costco, then Albertson wins and Costco loses. Right? That's how that, that works. If everyone shopped at Costco for everything, then Albertsons would lose, and you would have too much ketchup, Right? That would that'd be the, and, and they're in competition with each other, and they're working hard to get your dollars. And sometimes people impose those views on, on churches. If people come to Harbor Life, the church that we're so graciously hosted by, then they're not coming to Wellspring Fellowship, and so that's a positive for Harbor Life and a negative for us. Or if people leave Wellspring Fellowship and go to Waypoint, then it's a negative for us and a positive for them. 
It depends on who the people are. Amen? No, that's not how it works at all. Right? See, there's this idea of market share. There's so many people in our particular market, and we're competing to get them to church. And so we compare what we do to what they do, and we try and do this, that, or the other thing. But that's not the way God's church is to work. That is not what God had in mind for churches. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, and another says, I follow Cephas, and still another says, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? (laughs) I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except for Crispus and Gaius, and no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanias. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. But, But for Christ, he did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, I don't want to pull this too far out of context, right? He was writing to one church, and and within that one church in Corinth, and within that one church there were factions. But I believe the application goes further because there was a church in Ephesus and Galatia and Rome and Smyrna and, and, and all of these other churches. And here's where the rubber meets the road. The church is not divided. It is not divided. We wear the same uniform. We, we act like it. We work together in unity. And guess what? The church becomes more powerful and effective when we do. But when we compete and we strive against each other, then the church becomes weakened, and the result is less fruit, not more fruit. Less fruit. I'm part of the KP Ministers Association, and monthly we get together and visit and fellowship and encourage one another, and we, and we pray for each other. I've been a part of it for a long time now, and and once a year we go out and meet at Gateway Park and have a a joint worship service together. And the first year we did it, and I think the second year we did it, we took communion together, which was amazing because there are so many different traditions about communion. We're going to be talking about that, one of these open-handed things. But it it, it was amazing, and you know what? I am not in competition with those other folks. I am not in competition with those other folks. I don't try and take folks from their church, and they don't try and take folks from ours. On occasion, people switch churches for various reasons, and we will talk about it. You know why? Because sometimes people leave messes in one church and try and avoid the clean up on aisle four thing and go to a different church. Right, And so we'll talk to it, and and they need to be encouraged. And so all of us pastors are unified, and so we just come together as pastors and say, okay, how are we going to clean this up? We're going to go talk about this. But why have different churches then? Why isn't there just one huge church? The early church tried that. It didn't work out so good. Right? I, I think there's some really good reasons not to have one huge church. One, when you get too big, you stop being personal and you become very institutional. It can become more about the institution and less about the message of the gospel. Church becomes all about making the church go instead of about the message. I saw a Babylon Bee, which was really funny, and I love Babylon Bee, probably the best source of news out there. And, and I, I saw it, and it, it had a family that were really excited because they got the golden ticket and they had their one-time Lifetime visit with the pastor from Saddleback. Once in a lifetime. Now, when you just stop and think about that for a minute, if you have a church of 15,000 people, and you started figuring out if he had a one-hour visit with each member of the church, how long that would take and how long Rick Warren is, how old he is, right? He may not have enough days. See, I think... When we get too big, we stop being personal. I think Christianity actually operates best when it's in small but powerful groups. That being said, there's different definitions of small, right? I mean, some would say 100 to 150 is the perfect size. By the way, the average church in the United States of America is under 100. That's the average church. They're not the ones you see on TV, but that's the average church in America. 
But I think there's value in being a little bit larger, but not so large you don't know everybody's name. See, I want us to be large enough to bring resources to bear in our community, but not so large that we begin to spend more and more on overhead and administration. I think when you look at the different churches in the community, I think we can be unified but unique. Unified but unique. We're the only church on the Key Peninsula that will emphasize the Sabbath. We are. There are others that agree that the Sabbath is important, but they don't necessarily emphasize it other than occasionally, right? We emphasize it because we believe it to be what helps us as a people. It helps our marriages and our family and as worshipers be healthy because God says take a day off, so we, we take a day off. We spend it in worship. So in that way, we're unique, but we're still in unity with those other churches. Worship style and expression is unique from church to church. Right? So we might attract or repulse some people, and the same goes for, for some others. Right? If you are really, really into bluegrass, we'll pray for you, but brothers and sisters, right? You know, you're not going to experience it here. Now, there are some churches on the key where you would experience it weekly, and you could be blessed by that worship, right? You could be blessed by that worship. So maybe in our expression of worship or our, 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 our style, some people really like to go to a formal kind of church. We're not formal here, amen? We're not formal. I believe in the John, Baptist, uh, John the Baptist code of, of dressing for church, right? John the Baptist, he, he wore sackcloth. He wore uh, camel hair. Uh, why? Because he wanted to be the least, uh, he wanted to be the least. He was wearing rough clothing. And so you know, I dress up a little bit, right? Sometimes I wear jeans, you know, just because, uh, wow, we, we don't want to be, we don't want you to feel like, oh, my goodness, I've got to put everything on and have everything just right to come to church. I don't care what you wear to church. I'm just glad you're here to worship with us. So when we think about the different styles of churches, how we can be unique in our expressions of worship. We can be unique in, in, in the atmosphere, in the ethos even of the church. Some churches are all about the homeless, and that is their big thing, and God has put that on them. And man, every, their, their, their whole uh, ministries are surrounded by that. Other churches are about rehabilitating the, the people that are in prison. My brother goes to church, or not my brother, my brother's... Uh, Son, Aiden, you remember Aiden. Aiden, when he was here, Aiden is going to a church in Salem that is amazing because their big deal is prison ministry, not just not the prison ministry when they're in prison, but when they get out. And they, they bring those people to church and they pick them up in vans and, and they're bringing them to church and they got like tattoos on them and stuff like that. And, and, and the, one of the reasons why is because a number of the leaders in the church have been to prison. That's amazing. And that's not me. Right? God has not laid that on my heart. I haven't been to prison yet. I, you never know. And, and so, you know, he just hasn't put that. But So there's these different styles of churches, different ministries that God has put in the churches. And so in our diversity, what actually happens is it increases the fruit that God produces. It increases the fruit in the diversity. If we were all one monolithic church, we would only reach a small section. But God wants the world saved. He wants the world rescued. And so we are diverse. But in any of these churches, the message you hear about salvation or who the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit is, or what comes at the end, or the other essentials, the same message is taught in church from church from church from church from church. See, that is unity. That is speaking with one voice, and in doing that, we'll actually produce more fruit. But if, on the other hand, we tried to compete, or build one up while tearing one down, the results would not be greater fruit. It would be just the opposite. So our spiritual unity actually produces more fruit for the kingdom of God. It communicates the message of the gospel more clearly. There's one final blessing of our unity. 
Our unity helps refine us. We sang that, that we want to be in the refiner's fire. I want to be refined. Consume me. Refine me. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord. Spur one another. You see, it was written to a singular church, but here's the reality. It applies to all of us believers across all churches as well. We need to be spurred on. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. We need to be spurred on. So when I hear about programs and things that Waypoint is doing, I get excited about those. And when they hear about programs and things that we're doing, they get excited about those. In fact, one of the things that happens in our monthly meetings is we talk about, you know, what are you doing? Uh, one of my favorite conversations is, what are you preaching on right now? What are you preaching through? And, and listen to the guys talk about where the Lord's leading them and what they're, what they're preaching about. Go, oh, wow, you know, I haven't preached that forever. And, and we encourage each other. We hear about their programs. <coughs> but, we're, but we're also, we're, we're challenged by each other. When we talk with believers from other churches, they have differences in worship style or even different takes on things in the Bible that are not essential. And those different tanks, takes on it, they spur us on to consider them and to interact with them. And we're, as if we were outsiders, we wouldn't have that. If we were only talking to outsiders, we wouldn't have that kind of conversation, right? If somebody were outside of the essentials, we wouldn't have that conversation. But within the essentials, we can have these wonderful theological discussions. And, and i got to tell you, when the pastors get together, oh, we like, we like to talk about stuff. It is, it is one of our favorite things. We get together, and, and Drake and I talk about it. It's like, I wonder what we're going to talk about this week, you know? I wonder what we're going to talk about this month. It's going to be this next Tuesday. I can't wait. I wonder what we're going to talk about. I suspect we're going to be, be, be talking about what's going on in the world, amen? <laughs> it's getting a bit sporty out there, right? And uh, we'd just be thumbing through Revelation and say, what do you think, boys? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's getting a little sporty out there. And, and it, it ought to be interesting for us to talk about it and, and, and see what they think about things. And I, I look forward to that. We sharpen each other. We spur e each other on. There's a real danger to churches, too, when they decide that they are the true church and everyone else is apostate. Or when they decide that their unique belief has made them uniquely chosen by God. Right? It usually leads down a, a dead end. It usually leads down a, a dead end. I know that in particular because I think Sabbath is one of those things that has a real danger factor to it for churches. There are some churches that, that emphasize the Sabbath who also emphasize the idea that because they emphasize the Sabbath, they're really special. They are the church. And everybody else, well, you're not really in the club. We might wink, wink, nod, nod. You're my brother in Christ, right? Yeah. And, and, and they make the Sabbath the actual litmus test. For them, the only essential really is the Sabbath. All the rest kind of fit in after that. Even in the conversations, it's, uh, so when did you become convinced of the Sabbath? <laughs> you're kind of just scratching your head going, What? What is that? See, I, I don't think the Sabbath makes us any more God's church than anybody else's church. We emphasize it because of a, a very important thing. We want people to rest, and we think it's biblical. But it's an open hand thing. It's not in the essentials. And when we start taking open hand things and putting them in the essentials, then guess what? What happens is we start saying, well, we're the special church. We're the special people. We're the new chosen people of God. And unity begins to break down. And fruit begins to diminish. Attitudes towards one another becomes pride and puffed up. God is never happy about that kind of situation. Never happy about it. It's with all humility that we, we hold all humility, that we, we hold on to the essentials and we hold on to them dearly. But the, 
are areas of worship that are open-handed. We leave them open-handed and we say, this is us, what do you do? Wow, that's great. There's some wonderful, wonderful worship traditions that are not ours in other churches. And we can look at them, admire them, and not feel threatened in any sense at all. See, that's a dead end when people start thinking their unique beliefs have made them uniquely chosen by God. But when I realize that there's a spiritual unity in all believers, then my brother from Waypoint is indeed my brother, and my sister from Lake Bay is a sister, and then I can listen and be encouraged and spurred on by them. So do you get the picture of what God is doing in this unity? Isn't it an amazing thing? Do you get the picture of that? See, he's created a church that's not monolithic, but rather that is one that is in unity yet diversity, one that can encourage each other with our differences yet on these essentials and the message of the gospel. It is complete, rock-solid unity. He can use a church like this to reach all the different kinds of people in all kinds of different situations. He can create an environment where everyone's talents and gifts can be used and expressed. Right? Right? Remember the lady that used to play the organ for us way, way back? She came to our church because we met on Saturday, but she went to St. Paul's St. Paul Baptist Church in Tacoma. African American lady, and she could play this the African American Southern style organ. And at that time, we had an organ in our church, and she would come and we would have her do a special for us. It was not our style of music. I mean, really, I, I can't I can't do it. I, I wish I could, but I can't. They invited me to a Christmas service. I told you this story before, but they, they had us sit up in the front because in their culture of their church, the pastors are reverenced, and, and they put us in front, and they introduced Susan as the first lady of Wellspring. I've never seen her more uncomfortable in my life. It was awesome. And then he made fun of me because I tapped my foot on the wrong beat. Right? I just can't do it. And so, you know, it's so beautiful when I realize that we, we try and encourage diversity. We try and encourage diversity as much as we can, but we also realize that there's diversity in the different kinds of churches. I consider them brothers and sisters in Christ. So everyone's talents and gifts can be used. Her talent, she was their organ player, and her talents were used every Sunday in a beautiful, beautiful way. She also introduced me at potluck to collard greens. I'd never had them before. Oh, she made them good. Almost made me feel Southern. I've never been to the South. Don't plan on it. But, you know, it was, it was really good. And that's the diversity that God can do. And then, not only that, he can encourage us and spur us on through the other people. Spur us on. Challenge us, maybe on some things that we hold on to. Make us look at it a little carefully. And maybe we can, we can challenge them. What a thought. So we believe in the spiritual unity of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you today. Recognize that spiritual unity. Don't be threatened by it. Recognize it with joy. Because when we're in that spiritual unity, we know that our unity is the will of God. Jesus prayed for it. Paul encouraged it and corrected those who would divide the church only to do those things, to say those things that promote our unity, not just inside these walls, but outside our walls. Outside our walls. Recognize our unity so we don't get caught up and trapped by the evil one in a, a spirit of competition. Rest in that will, knowing that if one church is doing well, it's for the good of all of us. I'm glad other churches are growing and doing great. It spurs me on. I want to do that too. But maybe God's got a different plan for our church or a different timeline for our church or different things. Maybe, you know, I don't know. But I'm glad to see that growing. That's great. Unity produces more fruit for the kingdom of God than competition. And lastly, let's open our ears and our eyes so that we can be refined and help refine others. We can listen to those who share these essentials. And while we may not agree on the non-essentials, it's in a spirit of love and understanding. We can listen to them, and that can make us stronger as God intends. That's what God's doing when we believe in the spiritual unity of believers in 
Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be part of such a big church. God, we're part of a big church, not a little church. It's a, it's a church that it doesn't just meet here, but it meets here today. It'll meet here tomorrow. It meets in different buildings all over the Key Peninsula and all over this state and all over this nation and all over this world. And it's your will that we would be one. Jesus, you were praying for that, that we would be one. So I pray, Lord, that our human thoughts, our human ideas about competition, our ideas about being right or how important our ideas are to us, that, Lord, we would just put those aside and hold on to the unity we have in these essentials. Knowing, God, how vital, how important it is that the world see a church that is unified. And I pray that we would indeed produce fruit and we would honor you with it. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.